I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Not Doubting Thomas, the Aquinas Revival. The University of Notre Dame, where I got my PhD, is known for, among other things, college football, the gleaming golden dome that adorns its main building, and its Catholic identity which in philosophical terms means that Notre Dame has always been a home for teaching and research devoted to Thomas Aquinas, the most canonical philosopher of the Catholic faith. These things have stayed with me in later life. As you know, I'm very invested in football, albeit the more globally relevant version that Americans call soccer. After quite a bit of hair loss, I am now adorned with a gleaming dome of my very own, and have often had the chance to teach and think about Aquinas. Indeed, If you work in medieval philosophy, you simply have to engage with Aquinas, since he is generally recognized as the most important Latin scholastic theologian and philosopher. As I pointed out when we looked at him here on the podcast, that recognition came only somewhat later. During and shortly after his own lifetime, he was certainly seen as significant, but more as one of several leading thinkers of the period, alongside Albert the Great, Henry of Ghent, and Duns Scotus. But he was also controversial, given his devotion to Aristotle, and attachment to certain philosophical doctrines that were unpopular at the time. Indeed, he's thought to have been one of the targets of the condemnations handed down by the Parisian church authorities in 1277. How then did he ascend to his present exalted status? The answer has something to do with his order, the Dominicans, and something to do with our current preoccupation, the Counter-Reformation. After lobbying from the Dominicans, Aquinas was canonized in 1323, about 50 years after his death in 1274. Shortly after that, he was absolved of any charges connected to the Paris condemnation. But this didn't entirely free him from his controversial status. Adherents of Scotus and of the nominalist philosophy pursued by Occam, Buridan, and others criticized Aquinas on a range of topics. This provoked the Dominican, John Capriolus, who taught at Paris around the turn of the 15th century, into writing a massive defense of Thomas' thought, mounting a counter-criticism against Scotus, Occam, Henry of Ghent, and so on. About a hundred years later, the same agenda was pursued at Paris by another Dominican, Peter of Crockert. He was a student of John Mares, who defected from nominalism to Thomism and took up the project of editing Aquinas' Summa. Crockert is indirectly important for the story we'll be telling over the next few episodes because he was the teacher of Francisco de Vitoria, the leading figure of the school of Salamanca in Spain. When Vitoria came back from Paris to teach at Salamanca, he lectured on the basis of Crockert's new edition of Aquinas. Eventually, the Summa was the standard textbook for theology faculties across the Iberian Peninsula. This explains why the major Jesuit philosopher Gabriel Vázquez who studied under Domingo Bañez at Alcalá, went on to write a four-volume commentary on Aquinas that appeared between 1598 and 1615. As for Italy, yet another Dominican, named Dominic of Flanders, was a leading exponent of Thomism in the late 15th century. Like Aquinas, he wrote commentaries on Aristotle, and like Capriolus, he resolutely defended Thomism against its rivals. Then there was Cardinal Cajetan, Italy's greatest exponent of Aquinas' thought, will be meeting him shortly. Thomism was also flourishing in Germany, thanks initially to Henry of Gorkum at Cologne. He wrote a popular textbook based on Aquinas' masterwork, the Summa Theologiae. By the end of the 15th century, Leipzig was emerging as a particular center for Thomism in Germany, something we can illustrate with the career of Magnus Hunt. Hunt was the vice chancellor at the University of Leipzig in 1504 to 1505, and we have some records about the sort of intellectual activities he oversaw. There was, of course, the standard fare of disputed questions, sometimes along surprisingly entertaining lines. For instance, why does the bear become fat when it sleeps, when with humans it's the reverse? But the students at Leipzig were also served up heaping portions of Thomas thought. Cafriolis's writings were used as a basis for teaching, with a course of lectures extending over no fewer than nine years. In Hunt's own writings, especially a treatise On the Dignity of the Human from 1501, we can see that humanism was influencing German Thomism. Even the title is, of course, reminiscent of Pico della Mirandola's famous oration on the same topic. Hunt's anthropology is deeply optimistic. He believes that the study of philosophy in particular can help humans to restore the nature that has been corrupted by sin 
given that he was writing almost two decades before Luther will come along, this can't be understood as a response to the Reformation. Rather, this illustrates the sort of Catholic thinking that Luther would shortly be attacking with such vigor. When the Reformation did erupt onto the scene, Aquinas would be a primary inspiration, even the primary inspiration, for the Catholic response. The theologians at the Council of Trent drew extensively on the Summa, and the Pope declared Aquinas a doctor of the church in 1567, shortly after the close of the council. So we might point to this period, the mid-16th century, as the moment where Thomism surged ahead of its rivals. From now on, the thought of Aquinas would increasingly be seen as especially authoritative, with obvious effects on the historiography of medieval philosophy. Why then did the Counter-Reformation look to him above all others? Well, as we've just seen, Thomism had established a presence throughout the Catholic world, and one of the most prominent orders, the Dominicans, had taken him as their leading light for a good two centuries already. A more speculative, but I think plausible, explanation would be the subtle but unmistakable relevance of nominalism and voluntarism to Luther's thought. Aquinas wrote before the rise of nominalism, and defended a more intellectualist position in explaining human action, meaning that he gave the leading role to reason rather than the will. In these respects, Thomism may have seemed to offer an especially good contrast to Lutheran philosophy and theology. And then there were the Jesuits. As we saw at the end of the last episode, they considered Aquinas a special teacher whose views should be maintained whenever possible. As that wording suggests, Jesuit philosophers did not follow Aquinas uncritically. In fact, Vittoria explicitly taught his students not to accept Aquinas' views before thinking things over themselves, though he presumably expected them to discover that they agreed for the most part. In episodes to come, we're going to be seeing that they were innovative thinkers who developed on or diverged from Aquinas on a wide variety of topics. As we'll also be seeing, philosophers who took themselves to be agreeing with Aquinas often disagreed with one another, just as happened with Aristotle and other authorities. Still, Counter-Reformation scholasticism was like Notre Dame in the 1990s. It was understood that the best offense is a good defense, and for the sake of tackling Protestantism, there was no getting around Aquinas. The most central exegete of this most central Catholic authorities was, of course, a Dominican. His name was Thomas de Vio, but he's generally known as Cajetan, this based on the name Gaetanus, indicating that he hailed from the city of Gaeta, in the kingdom of Naples. He was born there already in 1469, meaning that he was a mature and well-established thinker by the time Luther came along. Cajetan had already written important treatises on Thomas' thought, for example, a commentary on Aquinas' short but important metaphysical work On Being and Essence, and a treatise on the concept of analogy, which I'll be discussing later in this episode. Starting in 1507, Cajetan embarked on a massive commentary devoted to the Summa, a daunting undertaking but a predictable one, too, given that the Dominicans had established the Summa as their main teaching text for theology. It replaced the long traditional choice, Peter Lombard's Sentences. Aquinas himself had commented on that work. Cajetan's commentary on the Summa has been somewhat unkindly described as a turgid leviathan in which the scholastic method is pushed to the extreme. Where Thomas makes one distinction, it is typical for Cajetan to make four further distinctions of his own. But as we'll see, those distinctions do often allow him to make Aquinas' teachings more precise, and to answer open questions left by his great Dominican forebear. Alongside these scholarly projects, Cajetan served the church as a diplomat, representing the Pope in Germany and Hungary. He was appointed to reach a view on Henry VIII's request for a divorce, and on scriptural grounds advised that it should not be granted. An even more famous exploit was an encounter with Luther himself in the city of Augsburg, this was in 1918, so right around the time that Luther was emerging as a threat. Cajetan debated him on topics like the sacraments and indulgences, and then wrote against Lutheranism until his death in 1534. But Cajetan's approach was fairly moderate, as shown by the fact that he chastised some of his fellow Catholics for throwing around accusations of heresy against the Lutherans. Expressing a conciliatory attitude, in evident contrast to the later activities of the Inquisition, he told them, We must not strike out too much. They are errors, not heresies. Cajetan devoted careful thought to the epistemological status as well as the content of Christian belief. He took from Aquinas the idea that theology is a science based on first principles that we accept through faith. For instance, that God is a trinity, or that Christ was the incarnation of God. 
All the conclusions reached by theologians are contained implicitly, or virtually, in these principles. They just need to be worked out. As a theologian himself, Cajetan naturally thinks that this is a worthwhile enterprise, but it is not absolutely necessary. The everyday believer who just accepts the core principles of faith has done enough to be a full member of the church and eligible for salvation. In a sense, even such a believer is a theologian, but only in that they accept the first principles that are the basis for explicit theology, the sort of thing practiced at the universities. Obviously, this is quite far from the Lutheran notion of a priesthood of all believers. Regardless whether the believer is a university schoolman or a simple peasant, their belief through faith is not certain in the way that first principles of philosophy might be. Though Christians may be extremely confident that God is a trinity of three persons, they do not accept this truth in the same way that they accept self-evident first principles, like the principle that triangles have three sides. Still, Cajetan does think that the Christian is accepting the principles by something more than an act of will. They have good reasons for these beliefs, and the voluntary act of faith is led by these reasons. Which means, in his scholastic terminology, that faith is an intellectual virtue. Nicely illustrating something I mentioned just now, the Thomas tendency to give reason, or intellect, primacy over the will. As for those reasons that support faith, a point Cajetan makes on this score clearly divides him from Luther, church authority along with scripture itself is an infallible source of religious precepts. That applies to the traditional teachings of the church and also to pronouncements made by sitting popes. For Cajetan, the pope is a kind of prophet who cannot err when he is under divine influence. As this already indicates, Cajetan was a stout defender of papal supremacy. He had no time for the movement I've had occasion to mention in the past, which we call conciliarism. This is the idea that church doctrine can be settled by general councils of church officials, who represent the whole community of believers. Cajetan was so opposed to conciliarism that he forbade Dominicans to attend a church council at Pisa in 1511. For him, the Pope is comparable to a monarch wielding supreme authority. Actually, papal authority is for him more supreme in the church than would be the power of a king in the secular realm, because he allows that something like a conciliarist view could be appropriate in worldly affairs. After all, the king really does represent all his subjects, so he should be bound by their will. By contrast, the Pope does not represent the believers of the church community, he represents Christ himself. For Cajetan, this move is just intended to highlight the unique nature of papal authority, but the idea of a secular conciliarism will be taken up in the political theories of Vittoria and other scholastics, as we'll be seeing soon. These points about faith and church authority reveal Cajetan as an archetypal figure of the Counter-Reformation. He's no less paradigmatic when it comes to the careful engagement of Renaissance Thomists with the thought of their greatest hero. It would be worth picking out pretty well any theme from Aquinas and looking what Cajetan has to say about it, but I'm going to talk about the aspect of his philosophy that is best studied, his theory of analogy. That it is so well studied is in part thanks to Joshua Hochschild, who as it happens is a friend of mine dating back to our time together as graduate students at Notre Dame. And I have to mention his wife Paige Hochschild too, who has written an excellent book on Augustine's theory of memory. Josh's doctoral thesis, which later appeared as a book, is about Cajetan on analogy. I think we would both have been very surprised 25 years ago to discover that someday I'd be summarizing it on a podcast, not least because podcasts didn't exist yet. The fundamental question here is how words apply to God. If you say something like, God is good, are you using the word good in just the same sense as you would if you said, Notre Dame has a good philosophy department? God would presumably enjoy a greater, even infinite goodness that would not be possible for philosophy departments or anything else in the created world. But the significance of the word good could still be the same in both cases. This was the view of Aquinas's fellow leading medieval thinker, Duns Scotus, who argued that terms are applied to God and creatures unifically, that is, with one and the same meaning. Alternatively, you might think that since God is utterly transcendent and incomparable to worldly things, Words must be applied to him in a completely different or equivocal sense. Then there would be no overlap between the meaning of good when we say God is good and the philosophy department is good. Aquinas' position is usually presented as a compromise between these two interpretations. He says that there is an analogy between words like good, wise, and powerful when applied to creatures and when applied to God. God is goodness, wisdom, or power itself, whereas creatures are denominated by these terms in a merely derivative sense. 
The question is how exactly we are to understand this analogical relationship. It is a pressing concern for Kajetan, not just for the obvious reason that we'd quite like to know what's going on when we talk about God, but also because the viability of theology as a science turns on having a cogent answer to the question. After all, theologians are in the business of offering arguments about God's nature, and these arguments often involve transferring features of created things to God. Here's an example. Every perfection is in God, wisdom is a perfection, therefore wisdom is in God. In the second premise, wisdom is a perfection, the word wisdom is presumably being used in the way applicable to a wise human, since it's by thinking about wise humans that we know wisdom is a perfection. If the word wisdom is then used in a completely different sense in the conclusion, therefore wisdom is in God, the argument is invalid. It would be like arguing, the fisherman is fishing from the bank, a bank is a financial institution, therefore the fisherman is fishing from a financial institution. To avoid this problem of outright equivocation, we need to say that wisdom, in some sense, has the same meaning in the premises and the conclusion of the argument, and likewise for other attributes of God used in theology. On the other hand, to safeguard divine transcendence, and to avoid agreeing with Scotus instead of Aquinas, Cajetan does not want to say that it has exactly the same meaning. What Cajetan needs, then, is an interpretation according to which the two uses of the analogous word are somehow the same, somehow different. That's how Cajetan puts it, but I find Josh's explanation more illuminating. Analogy is similar to unification, where word, concept, and thing are common, and unlike equivocation, where only the word is common. So wisdom, when applied first to creatures and then to God, would not be like bank applied to a river bank and then to a financial institution, words that just happen to sound the same. They must have a meaning in common. This meaning is what Cajetan calls an imperfect concept. That is, we have an imprecise, or as he says, confused idea of wisdom that covers both the wisdom of God and the wisdom of a wise human. The reason we can have this imprecise bridging concept is that there is a certain likeness between the two cases of wisdom, even if God's wisdom is also very unlike human wisdom, for example, by being infinite. And since we are familiar with a likeness of God's wisdom, namely cases of human wisdom, we can grasp divine wisdom, even if not fully. A striking feature of Cajetan's treatment here is that it is so focused on the meaning of words. Indeed, as Josh stresses, he is thinking of the whole problem not as belonging to metaphysics, but as falling under logic. In this case, the part of logic we would call philosophy of language. Still, the theory has metaphysical application, as we can see by thinking about a paradigm case of the analogy theory. What happens when we use the word being for God and for created things? As in the other cases, God will not be just any being, but being itself, esse ipsum. Indeed, Cajetan thinks he can prove that all things come from being itself as follows. The existing things around us have natures that do not include their own being. For example, a golden dome. By its very nature, it must be gold and dome-shaped, but it does not need to exist or have being. Given that it does exist, it must have gotten its being from something else, for instance, the architects. If in turn that something else is like the golden dome, architects don't have their being intrinsically either, then we again have to ask how they got to exist, and so on. The only way to stop this regress, this chain of causes that provide being to their effects, is to posit something that has being intrinsically. But that could only be being itself, the cause of all other cases of being which we can identify with God. Using scholastic terminology that goes back to Avicenna, Cajetan says that in creatures, essence is distinct from being or existence, whereas God's essence just is his being. This means that there is only an imperfect likeness between created and divine being. The two are related through an analogy, as we saw with wisdom. All this is put forward by Cajetan as an interpretation of Aquinas, of course, but also as a rebuttal of metaphysical views based on Scotus, for example, the holder of the chair of Scotist philosophy at Padua, Antonius Trombetta. Which is a helpful reminder that not all Catholic schoolmen in the Renaissance period were embracing Thomas' positions. The theory of analogy had been subject to controversy back in the 13th century when Aquinas put it forth, and it remained controversial in the 15th and 16th centuries. Nor was that the only position associated with Aquinas that provoked opposition. As we discussed back in episode 244, his least widely accepted doctrine in his own time was perhaps his idea that each substance has only a single form. Let's take as our example Thomas Aquinas himself. Most scholastics would have thought that in addition to having the form that is his soul, Thomas would have several other substantial forms, for example the form of body, 
This would explain why his body remained a body when his soul departed in 1274. He was already a body before he died, and simply persisted as such through the change that was his death. Aquinas disagreed. He thought that each substance has only one form, which in the case of a plant, animal, or human, like himself, would be its soul. This form somehow includes all lower forms, which are present in it only virtually or potentially. A later Thomas from Spain, the aforementioned Domingo Bañez, devoted about 15,000 words to discussing and defending Aquinas' unity of form theory in his commentary on Aristotle's On Generation and Corruption. Here he draws extensively on other commentators and Thomas thinkers, especially Cajetan. Against the idea that there is really a form of body present in a human substance, as well as a soul or human form, Banyas says that the extended dimensionality we associate with matter is only a mental abstraction, not a real feature of things out in the world. In other words, there is nothing out there making the human's body be a body apart from the human soul. When we distinguish between humanity and corporeality, that is just an operation of the mind. As we'll be seeing, this kind of move is very common in Spanish scholasticism. In a related debate, Banyas took up the question of whether all human souls are of the same type. Given the unity of form theory, you might think that variations between humans can only be explained with reference to their human forms, that is, their souls. After all, there are no other lower-level forms that a Thomas can invoke. Suppose, for instance, that we're trying to explain why some people are quicker at learning than others. A form pluralist, like pretty much anyone other than Aquinas and his followers, could say that the soul's learning activity is being impeded by lower-level forms that belong to unruly bodily elements. By contrast, a Thomist would seem obligated to say that variations between one human and another are due to the human's different souls, these being the only forms present in the substances. And indeed, Aquinas suggests in one passage of his works that better bodies have better souls. From this, Cajetan inferred that souls are unequal to one another. At some point while the fetus is developing, it takes on a soul of the type appropriate to its physical constitution. Cleverer people just get souls that are more potentially intelligent. This provoked a furious response from the Jesuit thinker Francisco de Toledo, who taught at Salamanca. He said that Cajetan's interpretation had implications that are completely stupid and ridiculous. It is just obvious that every human soul must be of the same type, since we are all members of the same species. This annoyed Bañez no end. It was impertinent of de Toledo to attack the great Cajetan in this way, and in fact, as far as Bañez could see, both positions had merit. One thing we can learn from these discussions is that philosophers who took themselves to be followers of Aquinas were not only apt to argue against nominalists or scotists, they were also apt to argue with one another. Bañez explicitly speaks of Thomists, clearly thinking of them as members of a movement or philosophical school, but he also explicitly acknowledges that there are differences of opinion between them. These might be traced back to diverging interpretations of Aquinas, or it might be a matter of philosophical disagreement. Actually, these thinkers, especially the Dominicans, were so committed to Aquinas' authority and so accustomed to presenting their own views in the context of commenting on Aquinas' writings that it can be hard to tell the difference. Having now looked at the historical context of the Counter-Reformation, and two important intellectual groups, the Jesuits and the Thomists, were just about ready to move on to what one might fairly describe as the main event of this mini-series, the subtle and brilliant thinkers who kept the scholastic tradition alive in Spain and Portugal in the 16th century. I've already mentioned Vitoria and de Toledo in this episode, and other names that leap to mind would include Molina and Suarez. We'll be looking at a variety of philosophical themes in their thought, from logic to metaphysics to political and legal theories. But first, I wanted to dispel an impression you might have drawn from this miniseries so far, that Protestantism had effectively no foothold among Southern Europeans and was relevant only in provoking Catholic counter-reformation thought. In fact, there were Spaniards who were impressed by the Lutheran critique and who were even willing to follow his lead. To explore this, I'll be joined for an interview with Andres Mesma, an expert on the topic. Back at Notre Dame, we were accustomed to shouting, Go Irish! during the football games. But next time, we'll be doing something much more surprising, going Spanish-Protestant, here on The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. 